when it comes to receiving signals, what's the difference between this inductor and this inductor? They're both 500 microhenries. Stick around. W1VLF. Hey everybody, my name is Paul W1VLF and welcome back to the lab. Um, this is kind of going to be a, a video about answering some questions that, that I've got here. Um, and um, what's the difference between this and this? Because the, there was quite a few questions. I want to clear up something though real quick. This is the second camera. What is this? This Oh, geez, you know, <laughs> uh, my sons are, are um, debating who came up with the idea for the Matt cam. I have three boys, Dan, Matt, and Steve, and this technology piece allows me to keep in contact with them all the time. And boy, did they give me a razzin for, the, uh, for that ham, the, um, the Matt cam. Because I mistakenly thought it was Matt that said it. It wasn't. It was Dan. One guy, one guy says, why don't you call it a ham cam? Another guy says, why don't you hang it on a slinky and call it the spiral ham cam? Uh, uh, anyway, and now they're texting me because they know I'm doing this video right now. Any Jesus. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this is killing me. I'm going to go put this away. Anyway, um, we're going to address a bunch of questions here. So, but from now on, this is going to be the ham cam, okay? So I'm going to put it over here. All right. So what I have here in my hand, we're going to do a lot of close-ups of this, and we're going to employ the ham cam for, for parts of it, um, is a 500 and something microhenry inductor. Because their question came up, well, if this loop is a big inductor, why can't you just use a small inductor like this in a resonant parallel circuit and use it as an antenna? And that's a pretty good question. I, 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 it was interesting. And the reason why you can't is, you probably can't even see this thing in my hand, but look at the, the area here. Let's say this is a meter square. This is about uh, a one square meter of error area, and this is a half a square, um, this is about a uh, quarter of an inch, so what's that, six millimeters, 36 millimeters square, I guess. I, I No, that's not right. But it's very small. It's about the size of a head of a pencil, but they're both 500 microhenries plus or minus. So we're going we're gonna to take a look at the, um, the series parallel arrangement on this and compare it to this. But to answer the first question, there's just a big size difference, and this is one of those cases where size matters. Um, also, I'll, I have some PowerPoints that I'll show you how this is wired up again, only in a little, little bit more clarity. Uh, and I want to shout out to uh, Julian, G4UET. Hope I got that right. Um, he was telling me that during the PowerPoint presentation part that, that the mouse wasn't there and, and it was confused. He didn't say it was confusing, but I can imagine how it would be because what I was seeing was different than what you were seeing. But I think I have that ironed out. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the individual loops, uh, loops here. Uh, we're going to call this side one and this one side two. And then that'll sort of, or section one and section two, and that'll carry over later. So let's get the uh, LCR meter out right here. And we'll do a close up on that. And I'll show you what happens when you put these two sections of coil in series and in parallel. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Let me set the uh, cameras up. Okay, here we are on the bench, the Group W bench with the ham cam um, and the LCR meter. If you, uh, if you can get one of these, it's extremely useful. Um, okay, so what are we going to measure here? We're going to measure uh, inductance. We're going to go to L. And here's that tiny little inductor with roughly the same amount of inductance as, that, as the uh, receiving coil. So it's about a half inch. 3 sixteenths, uh, 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. Let's just measure the inductance of it real quick. And it's about half a millihenry or 514 microhenries. So it ends up being very close in, in uh, inductance to the loop. And we're going to go over there and measure each section of the loop. 
But look at the size of this thing. It's the size of a pencil eraser, so it doesn't really have any area. So can you make a resonant circuit from a, a, lumped, in, a lumped inductor like this? Absolutely. Will it perform for receiving? Absolutely not. Um, and uh, not only that, the ferrite core in here makes the Q in the 20s instead of many hundreds. So let's take a look at one more thing real quick and we can write some of these numbers down. Here's the uh, tuning, tuning variable. I'll show you how we arrive at the high and low frequency that this loop will cover. So we, we, uh, we want to move this little off to the side here. And this time we want to go to capacitance. And if you remember, put all of our switches in and turn our, 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 our main tuning capacitor all the way up. Um, we have roughly 2,150 picofarads of, of capacitance. So we'll have to remember that. 2,150 picofarads of capacitance there, fully meshed. I'm going to enter those into the formula for resonant frequency after. And now I've turned all the, all the additional capacitance out and the residual is 11, 11 picofarads. So that's going to determine the high frequency of where this loop resonates. So I'm going to pull away from this and go to the other camera and I'll show you the, um, uh, the, 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 the loop inductances and how they're switched series in parallel. And you'll be able to see then uh, that it really, what's really going on in there along with the PowerPoint afterwards. So. I'm going to sign off of here for a second and then pick up on the other camera. Okay, so we're back at the loop here now. And again, the parallel and series uh, capacitor. And I'm going to, I'm going to use the uh, ham cam over there to, to record the inductance of each one of these windings. Now, this is what we're going to refer to as section 1, section 2. And this is end 1 and end 2. So remember about the phasing when you put them in series, just like batteries. If you put them in backwards, you'll get no voltage. If you put them in parallel, twice the current, you put them in series, twice the voltage. Uh, anyway, just remember that polarity is, uh, has a sensitivity here. So let's look at this uh, section one. I've cleaned off a little bit of the, the uh, enamel so that we can get a look at what section one is. And let's, uh, let's see what it says on the, well, I suppose, uh, let's, let me see, are we connected? Yes, okay. So there's section one. Section one shows about eh, 200, 201 microhenries. Let's take a look at section two, which is these two wires for this coil right here. Let me grab these. Take a look at that. Now it should be really close to being the same. It might be slightly different. Okay, so 204 microhenries. And I can make I can sure prove that that we're on that coil because if I squeeze these together it starts to go up. If I squeeze these together it doesn't make any difference. So we're on that coil. So now you would say, well, with two of those in series, the two two hundreds roughly, let's call it two hundred for the purpose of this, you should have four hundred microhenries. Well, that's not really true. Um, the the truth of the matter is the the formula for inductance is the square of the turns ratio. So what's the turns ratio here? Well, we have one coil and we have another one, so it's twice as much, so it's two to one. So two, two to one is a four times um, increase in inductance. So when I connect up to these two wires, which are the ones that go to the variable capacitor over there, we should see four times the inductance. So let's take a look at that. Okay, clearly it's not four times the inductance, and why, why not? Well, because these are not one continuous coil. They're not coupled tightly together. But if it was, two to two, twice as many turns would bring you to uh, around 800 microhenries. From 200 times four, because there's two sets, it would give you 800 microhenries. So now let's see what happens to the capacitance when we put these two in parallel. Okay. So let's, let's remember these numbers, 580 microhenries in series and 147 in parallel. We're going to take those numbers over to the computer bench there and look at the resonant frequency formula on a calculator and see where, where this really lands. 
So in order to make this antenna resonate at the lowest possible frequency, which we determined to be around 140 kilohertz by testing it with the radio, we're going to have to take the 586 microhenries and the 2100 micro um, picofarads here and we'll enter those into the formula. The other half of this equation is the highest we were able to go was around 2 kilohertz, uh, two, me 2 megahertz. So in that case, we're going to open this, we're going to take 147 microhenries and we're going to take all the capacitance out of this and, we're, and it ended up being something like 10 or 11 picofarads. We're going to take those values, put them into the resonant frequency calculator and see how close our determination was as to what's the real world. And any variance from, from what should be in the real world is going to be because of the minuscule amounts of capacitance that are in between these each turn. Because an inductor isn't really just an inductor. It's, it's, it has inductance, it has some series resistance, which is due to the wire size itself, and it has capacitance between the turns. So, anyway, let's go over to the bench, or excuse me, the computer, and see, what, see what, how these numbers line up when we look at the resonant frequency calculator. Okay, we uh, are we're back over at the ham computer now. Um, well, we've seen this slide before, but uh, there's a couple others I want to touch on real here, real quick. Um, I, I changed this one up a little bit for you guys because um, I wasn't clear in the last time. But uh, now we know that this is loop section one, loop section two for the parallel configuration. And these are the, the ends, end number one and number two. And they have to be... Um, connected the way that you see here. The, like I said in the uh, other piece of video, the phasing is important. Uh, otherwise, it, you'll subtract this one from this one and you'll have zero inductance and it, and it won't work. <clears throat> so, same over here. Just uh, I just repeated those, uh, the numbers, so you could copy this uh, for the phasing information and the switching information should you want to do that. Um, same thing, we, we looked at that just a couple minutes ago, so we'll pass that out. And here's basically what this thing is. It's an inductor or a coil and a capacitor in parallel. Same as the, uh, the notch filter that we built a couple weeks ago. But in this case, the capacitor is relatively small and the inductor has physically really large area to it, right? I guess a, a, a three feet or a meter roughly uh, square. So this is a large physical area here, and it picks up a lot of signal. So let me uh, let me just move down to. Uh, but remember this. Uh, remember that's the basic configuration of what we made. Now we do have a one-turn coupling loop over here for when we want to drive a radio, but purely what we made was um, a, a parallel resonant circuit, and when we use this with in proximity to a radio. That's all that's in this is circuit. And here's what it what it looks like in, in a little in, in more simplistic terms. The two inductors, the section one and section two are in parallel. I haven't drawn the switches for the sake of clarity. And in when I switch the button, the switch to, to series, that's what it looks like itself there um, with the two in series. So this ends up being the uh, 146 microhenries total and this ends up being the what 585 or so microhenry total. So that's that's the end of that. Let me uh, let me just uh, go over to uh, to this page. This this is um, this is a great place here goodcalculators.com some really really cool calculators here and, and I like to use these. And, and here's our resonant circuit. Same thing I just drew, only now you're looking at it um, and you're going to see the resonant frequency here. So let's put a couple of our values in here. Let's start off with um, the, first, the first value of, uh, let's say, roughly, um, uh, what was it, 10? Uh, no, yeah, 10 picofarads, something like that. I'll well, just put that, or, or, uh, we'll start with millihenry, microhenries here. Uh, 146 microhenries, so let's put that in. 146, and we've got to change this to microhenries. And then picofarads, we're going to put in 10. Let's call it 11, because I think that's really where it was. And it's in picofarads already. And calculate. Okay, 
with, with that much, with 11 picofarads in there from the capacitor, look how far off we are. We're almost at 4 megahertz. Well, the reason why we're at 4 megahertz is because of all that other distributed capacitance. So let's put in uh, 20, 20 picofarads instead. And let's put in 30. Okay. So there's probably... probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 40, 30 picofarads of distributed capacitance. The 10 that we're adding with our tunable capacitor and the 30 others to get this up to 40 to make that circuit resonate. We talked about the uh, interwinding uh, capacitance before and what a, what a coil really is. Okay, so let's go to the other end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum was with the inductors in series, we had, what, 586 microhenries, and the capacitance total was 2150, I believe, picofarads. And our before I hit calculate, <clears throat> I'm going to say, I remember our resonant frequency was roughly 140 kilohertz. Let's hit calculate here. The, measured with the, with the Sony radio. So it comes out pretty close, 142 kilohertz. So let's say you wound that coil to uh, 1,000 millihenries instead of the 585. Let's say you filled the whole coil out like we had originally. Um, that would drop you down to roughly 100 kilohertz. I'm not sure what that value would be. I didn't measure it at those, um, at, at those extremes. But you could sort of figure out what bands things cover. Um, but basically, with the, uh, let's see, 586 mil, uh, microhenries here, you can go cover from 140, 140 kilohertz all the way up to 2 megahertz. So that's what this is. It's an experimental platform. You know, not meant to be a build it exactly like this, because a lot of guys have been asking, well, how many turns would it take to get to here or to there? Well, you could you could sort of you could sort of uh, do it here on, on this page and figure figure that out. But more importantly, I wanted to make something that people could duplicate um, that was not critical and show them how to arrive at uh, a good working antenna. So uh, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the, in the comment section. Again, I appreciate everybody who has subscribed in the past and, and, and the new subscribers. I, I think it's up to 135, no, excuse me, 1,035 now. Uh, I really appreciate that. If you like what you see, you can go back and see parts uh, number two and part one and a lot of other weird videos uh, on, you know, stuff that you wouldn't call mainstream, but take a look anyway. Thanks a lot. 73. This is W1VLF from behind the microphone now signing off.